So hello, um, I'm Joey Quinones. I'm an assistant professor in sculpture dimensional studies, where I lead the fibers mixed media area. Uh, in my own personal work, I primarily use fibers and ceramics as a way to explore the inherent contradictions found in being black, queer, and Puerto Rican in the 21st century. But the impetus for that work stemmed from my training as a 19th century Americanist interested in the material, material culture of the time period. So prior to earning an MFA in 2019, I received my doctorate in 2003 from the University of Iowa in Literary Studies. And I taught literature of the US, of the US Caribbean and African diaspora for over 20 years. My earliest work was based on the image of the topsy-turvy doll. Here's a nice example of it, um, because it's such a strange anxiety producing doll form. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on here? Um, I was very interested in does the doll represent the fear or reality of racial mixing or mixed race bodies? What is it doing? Um, and so in time, I ended up adapting that form as a way to create 21st century topsy-turvy dolls more aligned with my own sense of a hybrid identity. So these are a few, just examples of previous work. And so I'm very grateful for um, the Berggren Forum as an opportunity to try to synthesize where I'm at right now. So that previous work that was really focused on the topsy-turvy doll is kind of past. Um, and now I'm sort of setting up the research agenda for the next three to five years, I think. So this is sort of ongoing, pro uh, ongoing project, and I'm pretty much in the early stages of this research. And I really wanna share with you um, how I conduct material exploration and research for a new body of work, because I think it's really important to show how visual artists can use research and how it is an important tool for approaches towards making. So the first um, part of my project I love applying to things. I applied to a residency um, at the Winterthur Museum Garden and Library in December 2021. I spent three weeks there um, conducting research at a historic house. Um, it was the H.F. DuPont Family House. It's the third largest um, house museum in the United States. It's over 10,000 square feet and has about 90,000 uh, decorative objects um, related to anything American. So I spent three weeks there um, and, the t and the project that I proposed was called American Noiseries, which is a completely made up word. Um, and it's a start to try to continue an exploration of hybrid, hybrid sculptural figurative forms that interrogate how narratives of the domestic, family and womanhood are complicated by this history of slavery in the Americas. And this time I thought what I really wanted to do was focus on objects during the Enlightenment era, 17th and 18th centuries. So the title American Noiseries is really a play on the European tradition of chinoiserie, uh, which basically reflected an 18th century fascination and interpretation of Asia through decorative arts. So the objects that were produced that we would sort of think about like blue and white China and willow paintings and all this stuff, right? Um, is not really actually anything Chinese. It's a European fantasy of what China was. And so the question that I had, um, I wanted to look at material objects of the 17th and 18th century to kind of see how are they a fantasy of what they think the Americas are. Um, and so that's why going to the museum, studying the objects was really an important part of my research. Um, so the picture here is actually the Winterthur House. Um, it's a really big building on the far right <laughs> um, is the actual house, the historic house. In the middle is the entrance to the research center. Um, and on the left is actually the library. So if you ever wanted to do research on chairs, furniture, textiles, it's amazing the amount of books, resources that they have here. And even more importantly, it's a paid 
<laughs> it's a paid residency. So it's the Maker Creator Fellowship. And it's specifically designed for artists and creative professionals um, to interpret the past and collections um, as a way to present it to a larger audience. So it's a paid residency to study their collections. Um, some of the other things that I think are really interesting at the Winterthur, uh, they have a graduate program in conjunction with the University of Delaware in art conservation. Um, and they also have a program in American material culture. So that's just some of the pictures. I got to uh, look at all the, the conservation spaces um, as well as conduct research. But very quickly, um, I found one of the, the, major, <laughs> the major problems that I encountered was that while this was sort of the largest collection of American de decorative arts, they had a very limited definition of American. Um, and so almost nothing from New Spain, barely anything from the Caribbean or Spanish colonies or anything that really had to do with Central South America, um, the Caribbean, um, which actually wasn't a, a bad thing, but it was a limitation. And it did help me realize um, that in my own research, how important it is for me to have this very expansive idea of what America or Americas are, simply because I think I definitely want a more global perspective on the African diaspora. So for example, um, in US history, we like to say a lot about the significance of 1619. Um, and that date is only significant really if you're only paying attention to the British colonies. What happens if you think about France? What happens if you think about Spain? What happens if you think about the history of um, Black people and Indigenous people forming unions um, in the 1500s, right? So I just wanted to show sort of an ex example of some of the artwork that I study pretty extensively. And so these are Costa paintings from New Spain, mostly um, Mexican, um, what would become Mexico. So it was New Spain in the 1700s. Um, 17 and 1800s. And so these paintings were produced um, during that time, time period and they were very unique in that they depicted, organized and categorized racial mixtures in a domestic setting. Um, and so this is sort of like the key enlightenment era artwork that's being produced. And while Winterthur had tons and tons and tons of paintings, they, they focus ex ex almost exclusively on British, um, some French examples. So I just kind of wanted to share that. Um, some of the other things that um, kind of made research um, a little difficult, but I actually think of those difficulties as opportunities and not necessarily setbacks. So sometimes you have to expand your time period or do sort of research adjacent, right? Um, one of the things that I was really interested in was that objects were classified by material um, or technique, but very difficult to search in terms of context. So, um, so this is a, a sort of example of what traditionally we would kind of think of chinoiserie. Um, so these are sort of the decorative forms. And part of the reason why I was interested in these forms is that um, new commodities demanded new forms. And so um, if sugar all of a sudden becomes widely producible, widely available, you need sugar bowls, right? So I was really interested in this sort of type of ceramic. And this is just other examples of some of the, th the material objects that I was studying. And I was really interested in the figuration. Um, and I tried to pay attention when the black, brown, indigenous people appeared. Um, and so I was really interested in these sorts of shapes that almost exclusively figured Western kind of Greek Roman figuration. Um, part of the other reason that I went to Winterthur is that it has one of the largest collections of soup bowls um, known as terrines. Um, the Winterthur inherited the Campbell's soup collection. Um, and so terrines became really popular um, during the reign of Louis XIV. Um, and they're 
highly decorative vessels designed to contain soups. Um, most of the time we find them in metal or ceramic and I was interested in looking at the metal examples. Um, I always knew these as soperas. Um, basically they're uh, soup vessels that were used in Santeria practices. Um, so it was really uh, fascinating to me to look at the sort of history of all these really intricate vessels. Um, and it sort of raises questions. Um, how can an object tell another story? So uh, most of these objects are classified by the maker, the company who manufactured the item, um, the materials. Uh, so we know a lot about who made it and how how much it costs to produce it. Um, but I was really interested in all these other stories of how people actually use them um, in ways that were, they were not designated to use. And so I think as artists, we have the opportunity to imagine and fill in the cracks in the archives. And so how do we reimagine um, objects? So I wanted to kind of share this other example. So this is a quilt piece um, made by Sarah Furman Warner. Um, she was the stepdaughter of a sail maker. Um, we know, we don't know too much about her, but we know that she was married in Trinity Church in New York City in 1788. Um, he was a merchant. Uh, they seem to be a few Warners and Williams that lived in the same area. Um, and she was widowed and living possibly died in 1805. Part of the reason um, why I share that story about the maker is that this is a really interesting object. Um, I looked for information about this object all over the place <laughs> because there's something really interesting and I hope in the detail that you can see, um, this is basically the biblical story of uh, Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus fleeing, um, fleeing Egypt. Um, but if you look really closely at the quilt, um, Mary is white. Jesus looks like a little white baby. Joseph is a black man. And it didn't matter how many people I asked at the Winterthur, like, do you have any idea? Like, is there any information about this? Um, why, why, is, why is Joseph black? Um, all they could really tell me is Sarah was the daughter of a sailmaker she lived in this place. And so um, this is one of the objects that I think actually really excites me a lot in terms of thinking about women's handwork um, and a craft like quilt and a techniques like applique um, to try to tell a little bit fuller story, um, the possibilities, right? The possibilities inherent. I'm super fascinated on why Joseph is black. That's an interesting story. Um, and art allows us the freedom to imagine those stories. The other, um, the other part of my research, I spent a lot of time looking at um, samplers. And so the one on over here <laughs> is actually a sampler um, from um, a, young, a young woman from Sierra Leone. Um, and I don't know if you can see it too well. Um, which is sort of really disturbing um, to think about how samplers um, are basically a way that um, it's an educational form for women and young girls. Uh, and I was really interested in when did race appear in some of these samplers. So one of my future goals is to recreate samplers to try to more accurately talk a little bit more about um, racial dynamics in the actual making of the sampler. The, the other sampler um, is a little bit later time period, it's 1853, um, but there's a whole series of samplers in the collection from um, uh, African-American schoolgirls in Philadelphia. And so it's interesting for me to think about fiber and something as routine as embroidery 
thinking of that as a way of indoctrination or learning cultural lessons. And so I'm really hoping to sort of reimagine the sampler. Other artifacts that I found, um, hair work. There were a lot of examples of hair work. So that big giant cabinetry is filled with hair, <laughs> hair that's twisted and braided. The other thing that surprised me a lot, which is right in the time period of which I'm studying, is sort of the cult of George Washington. And so the brooch that says Washington has locks of Martha Washington and George Washington's hair sort of um, braided together and preserved in this brooch. Um, and so I found that sort of as a fascinating object to think about which public figures we think of as deserving mourning. Um, and I'm always reminded in the back of my head um, how many enslaved people George Washington had. Um, this object uh, is a mahogany cabinet. And so these are sort of like the, the discoveries that you keep thinking about. What are the artistic possibilities um, with? So this particular cabinet is significant, one, because it's made out of mahogany, but also because it has um, in the interior, in the cabinetry, all these different locations that are associated with the global slave trade. So we know that this object was specifically used by someone who was in, involved in the slave trade. Um, but the importance of mahogany uh, is that mahogany was, um, is an indigenous uh, tree to the Americas and to the Caribbean. It was really popular in the 17th and 18th century. So um, mahogany was coming from Jamaica, Cuba, the Bahamas. Um, and it's also partly the, the desire uh, for mahogany furniture that became very stylish at the time which really did lead to Caribbean deforestation. Um, so most of the time when we think about the great cabinet furniture makers, we think of people like Chippendales, right? Chippendale who exclusively used mahogany. Um, and most of the mahogany that was used during that time period um, had to be cleared and processed by enslaved labor in the Caribbean. Um, I also spent a lot of time looking at indigo uh, indigo examples. So indigo ended up becoming a significant part of the South Carolina economy for roughly about 50 years. So from the late 1740s to the late 1790s, the British textile market was using almost exclusively uh, indigo that was grown in South Carolina. And it was processed by enslaved people in South Carolina. Um, behind rice, it was the second most valuable export indigo. So I spent a lot of time looking at this patterning um, that arrived there. <laughs> I've been talking a lot um, for years about race. Um, I've been talking a lot uh, about race um, and the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and there's not a lot of things that upset me. <laughs> I don't get too upset often anymore. <laughs> um, but I wanted to share sort of these two. These are sample books um, from a company. It was a British company that had offices uh, in Brazil. And um, these are samples of fabrics. Um, and if you read some of the letters in the sample book, even though the British had abolished the slave trade decades earlier, um, a lot of these businesses were still very much profiting from the slave trade. So <laughs> this is all still a little hard. Um, so basically in this correspondence to the Brazilian, um, to the Brazilian merchant, um, there's the suggestion that they should stock these patterns because these were very um, West African uh, traders, this appealed to them. So these were the patterns, the colors, the fabrics that would most easily allow them to purchase human beings. Um, and uh, in the Brazilian uh, slave trade, the word peca, which is um, the name 
for a piece of cloth is the same word that they used for an enslaved person. So as someone who studies fibers and textiles, this was kind of a very, a very difficult kind of um, thing to look at firsthand. I would expect something associated with slavery to look ugly. <laughs> Those are pretty, pretty fabrics, right? Um, other really sort of interesting things that I came across, uh, this is just a, a ceramic piece, um, definitely outside of my time period, but I had a fangirl moment. This is um, Dave the Potter, David Drake's pottery. Um, and it's also really hard, I think, sort of the challenge in museum collections is how to properly identify and contextualize objects. This was basically sitting on the fifth floor in the corner. You would never know that this is a Drake pot. Um, uh, this is another uh, particularly difficult um, discovery. I was looking in the collection and I just wanted to see if they had any of these. I've never seen one in person. It's a Charleston um, slave tax badge. Um, we, we had trouble finding it. And part of the reason why we had trouble finding it was that because it was displayed in a cabinet with all these other metal items like buckles. Uh, and so it was really disturbing that there was no didactic information about how this badge was different than all the other things around it. So um, some of the museum work was a little difficult. So after three weeks of research <laughs> um, in December, I used, um, I used the Winterthur research as a way to apply for the next residency, which was at the Kohler Arts Center um, in Kohler, Wisconsin. It's the arts industry residency. And I was there for three months in the foundry. So on top of working with new ideas, I was also working with a new material, <laughs> which is always fun. Um, so basically the Kohler Arts um, Industry Program, it's a paid res residency. They give you a stipend, they give you room and board, basically unlimited kind of supplies and technical assistance to make your artwork. So I was there for three months um, and I wanted to try to put some of these ideas that I had seen and images of things I had um, looked at um, into practice. And so this is just a, a picture of the studio space. And we worked primarily with resin bonded sand molds. Um, and so I'm just gonna show you a little bit of sort of the process shots. I did a lot of pattern making. Um, so uh, the one on the right, um, is clay, um, making the, the positives. I made a lot of plaster molds. I ended up working with silicone. Um, and I was really sort of interested in how do I put the human being back into these decorative, sort of decorative objects. So I experimented with plates and dishes um, and wallpaper references. And then this is just an image of the silicone molds getting prepped for resin bonded sand. So I spent a lot of my time in Goodwill stores finding things. Um, and then sometimes I sculpted straight. Um, if I wanted, if I wanted something specific, I would sculpt. Um, we primarily used iron and brass. And so those are the very heavy carts. <laughs> and some in progress work. And so I just wanna show you the final images are just images of art, um, of things that I tried out at Kohler. And like I said, this is probably a three to five year research project. And so this is just the beginning. And having made a few of these things, I know I have to kind of go back and revisit some of these ideas. Um, so these I made um, out of iron and they're flocked pieces. So at the time of the photo shoot, there was four, but there's actually 16 of these. Um, and when you put them all together, they make a pattern in the negative space. Um, so I'm really interested about patterns made in the negative space. Um, and so this piece, um, all 16 of these, I ended up donating to the Kohler company. I think these are funny, but uh, 
Baba, Black Sheep, and Little Boy Blue are actually um, nursery rhymes that come out of the 1700s. Um, and I was really interested in finding sort of the goodwill tchotchkes that sort of reference um, these two uh, nursery rhymes and do a little bit in terms of racial and gender, um, playing with gender and with race. So Baba, Black Girl in Sheep's Clothing, just cracks me up. Um, and then Little Boy Blue um, is actually two different figurines that were spliced and put together um, and then molded and cast in brass. This is an experiment I'll kind of come back to. One of the things that I really struggle with is how do you talk about the horrors of um, the transatlantic slave trade and their connection to the host of decorative luxury goods that it sort of spawned um, without always relying on the violence on a black body. And so this is sort of, I think, something that I'm gonna keep going back to, um, but I found these really um, decorative sort of antique that sort of fit the time period that I'm looking at. Um, and so I have the figure, I made the figure black um, and I just wrote dogs so dogs is kind of really faint i think i need to play around with the font <laughs> make it really more vibrant but this for me feels like a satisfying first step on how i can use words instead of act any actual depiction of violence i don't want to do that and the last work um, that i actually ended up producing at kohler um, it's called Still Life for Black Peter. Um, and so uh, this is sort of um, um, a conversation with, um, if any of you know Sanchez Helper in the Dutch tradition, um, he's a little elf, he's called Black Peter. Um, and there's a lot of controversy about the figure. Um, the UN had, had said that basically it promotes racism and that they should do away with the tradition of Black Peter, but it's sort of a custom where people will dress up in blackface um, to celebrate being Santa's helper. And so I was really curious um, about a lot of things in terms of Dutch still life painting, Dutch chocolate, Dutch tulips, um, the Dutch influence in the Caribbean, um, Dutch wax print fabrics. Um, and so I thought, well, what if I try to reimagine a Dutch still life, um, but have the focus be Black, Black Peter. So that was that piece. And so just to kind of wrap up, it's always good to have a final deadline <laughs> to make sure you produce all the things that you want to. Um, so I am preparing for a solo show at the Richard E. Peeler Art Center, DePaul University in 2023. Um, and what's really sort of exciting is the Winterthur Museum Garden and Library is having a group show called Transformations, um, where, all, where about 10 of the artists that took the artist maker grant that participated in that program um, are going to come back and have their work shown um, next to actual artifacts from the collection. So that's a really exciting project. We have about 600 square feet that we get to reimagine and the museum will build up the display for us. Um, but I'm very excited about having my fake artifacts next to real artifacts to see what kind of conversation we can have. Um, and that is 30 minutes. Thank you very much.
yep, the, the question was, have I had any ideas about um, materials such as iron and brass in relationship to the content? Yep. So there were a lot of things that I did not finish. <laughs> <laughs> um, some things that I cast, some things that I didn't get to cast. Um, but while I was working with the brass, I thought, I think when I first came in, oh, it's shiny. I want to work with brass. And then towards the end, I was like, I only want to work with iron. Um, and so one of the projects um, that I didn't get to complete, you would think three months is a long time, but I didn't get to complete it. Um, I was studying those Costa paintings and looking at the jewelry um, that's painted in those. Um, and I started casting those in iron um, just as a way to maybe really sort of think about the connections of iron, the way that iron was used, and then also historical connections with West Africa in terms of iron as a material. So right towards the end of, of my residency, I was really sort of, I just want to work with iron. Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, question was, do I have plans for um, imagining things that I didn't see there? Um, so in my past life as a literature professor, I used to love the quote by Toni Morrison. Um, if there's the book, if you can't find the book that you wanted to read, it's your job to write it. And I feel very strongly about that in terms of art making. So um, I'm really excited by imagining artifacts. So like what happens if I go back and look at a chair? And what happens if that chair form really showed the connections of um, African influence and indigenous influence and Spanish influence? What would that chair look like? And what would that chair look like if all three of those were actually equally valued? So like I have this fantasy of making this crazy hybrid chair and then putting a plastic slip cover over it because in my household, you protected your furniture with a plastic slip cover, right? Um, so it's really interesting, you know? So I'm, I'm imagining all kinds, all kinds of things um, in that way. Yeah, so um, thank you. So who are the artists and well, the writers and artists that I'm sort of thinking about in conversation in terms of relationships to the black body? Um, yeah, so I love Fred Wilson. I love mining, mining the museum. I think that was great. I kind of feel for me like that's a first step because I can't depend on any museum or collection to have the artifacts, right? If we really were going to talk about the truth about the racial and gender and class dynamics that were happening, those artifacts do not exist. The artifacts that do exist are fantasies, right? Um, so, you know, instead of finding the objects and putting them in conversation with each other, I'm kind of delighted that I feel it's my job to make those objects, right? Um, I think in terms of, of other writers and thinkers like um, 
Ish. There's there's a lot. I think I I always kind of go back to um, uh, Riley Snorton. Um, they wrote they edited uh, Saturation, which is really a wonderful sort of collection of essays. Um, but they also wrote this book that I absolutely adore, Black on Both Sides, and it's a racial history of trans identity. Um, and I love reading like our history and all these different types of books. So at Winterthur, I spent about five or six hours a day reading. Um, and part of what why I really enjoy it is because I really do think of the art making as visual metaphors. So poetry is is informing my work as much as as the theory. Um, but part of part of the reason why I love Black on Both Sides is that he introduces this idea of fungibility which has kept me up at night, but it was, he talks about racial fungibility. And so fungibility is like the idea that one object could stand in for another object. So it's like the basis of cryptocurrency. And so he talks about how the horror of um, the slave trade was the sense that one black body was completely interchangeable for another. Um, and so there are times where I just kind of wake up a little bit in a sweat thinking about that. Um, and so he explained it in such a way that it made complete sense to me that that is the horror that anybody will do. This body is as good as that body, as good as this body, and I control its purposes. Um, so I think that's one of the ideas that really kind of shape sort of what I wanna think about. Like, I wanna highlight that horror but at the same time, not at the expense of actual black people and black bodies. So I think that for the most part has been where one of the, one of the quotes that stayed with me. So I kind of collect quotes and then try to figure out what does this mean for me as an artist? There's, there's tons of stuff. Um, one of the things that come to mind is um, the way braiding of hair and sort of seeds were braided into people's hair um, so that it was a way of sort of like um, protection and giving you seeds and retaining a, a tradition and it's a connection. There was a film that came out really long time ago. It was a musical, um, oh, what is it? Ethnography of music. I can't, I, ethnic music, I can't get the word right. But um, there was a film that came out um, called The Language You Cry In. Um, and what they did in the film was that the 1930s WPA folks were taking um, people that were formerly enslaved and like asking them to their, give their stories. And what ended up happening was they recorded a song um, and the, the researchers realized that there were some words that really did sound like not English. Um, and so they ended up doing this whole research project where long story short, because of the language that was used in that 1930 recording, they were able to pinpoint it back, um, I believe it was to Ghana, to a specific area in Ghana. And they figured out that it was um, actually a funerary song. So it was a mourning song, but it had been handed down and handed down and handed down through generations. And so by the 1930s, people only knew it like a little kid's sing songy rhyme. Um, and then the other part of the film is researchers in the 1990s coming to see if there was anybody still in um, South Carolina that still knew that song. And there were. And there were. The language you cry in. 